Hello and welcome to this week's Super 6 podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's me, Laura Woods and Bio Akin Benoit. Hello, Bio. How are you? Yo, what's going on, LW? You good? I'm good. It's good to see you again. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not, I'm not that happy. No? Nah, man. Why is I, that? It was, a, it was a beating on Sunday. Like, it hurt my soul. Like, it, it really actually hurt my soul. I didn't, like, normally I'm kind of a person, I'll get twisted, I'm passionate, mm. but... I listen, I play football, it happens. But Sunday, really, I, I took off all social media, put one tweet and said, I'm done, good night, everybody. And I was just, I just sat there, yeah. So for those that don't know, Bayer was a massive, massive Liverpool fan. Um, as a neutral, I loved watching it, to be honest, because it was the most exciting thing I've seen in ages. And also because Villa are such underdogs. Manchester United, that game against Spurs, much tighter. Um, one team down to 10 men. You kind of expect that scoreline a bit more. You did. Nobody saw this coming, Bayo. Yeah, like neither did I. Um, nobody did. And it was... I was driving home and I was talking to my my friend on speakerphone who's a massive Liverpool supporter and he was like, listen, it's 2-0. I was like, what? Then he said, Salah scored 2-1. So I was like, yeah, 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 cool. We'll get a goal. Klopp will get us in at half time, and he'll just rally the troops. Then he said, it's 3-1. I was like, what? Then he said, it was 4 And it was, the worst thing is, because I wasn't watching it, so I just felt like I had no control of the game. Like if I'd watched it on TV, it would have made any difference. Mm. And then I got home and it just got worse. But you know what I did like? I liked the fact that, you know, Klopp goes to bat for Liverpool and he said a statement. He was like, look, it's hard for me to say it, but they wanted it more. I, I don't think he, I think he said, I don't think I've said this before, but they wanted it more. And Robinson, Robinson came out, VVD came out. And listen, you've got a front up to it. Like Liverpool's been on a bad boy run, but at the same time, 7-2, 7-2. So it hurt. But as long as it's a one-off, listen, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Well, hopefully for you, it is a one-off. Like, because I don't, don't be think, like that. I can't, I've never seen you like this. I don't think I can work with you while you are in this sort of, oh, you no, know, man. in this shape. Zap my energy. But let me get the energy Crazy. back. I'm back with you. I'll take yeah. some of your energy. You're in the room. Come on now. Let's We're back. do it. We're back. Should we tell you what's on, on the podcast this week? Yeah, come on then. What Should we, we got? Do that? Okay, here we go. This episode is a little bit special, Bio. Um, I'm so excited about this. We're going to be joined by the Super 6 legend himself, Mr. Jeff Stenning. Jeez, listen, there's not many people I'm gassed about, but Jeff's that guy. Like, he, listen, he's commentated many times when I've scored on a Saturday. It's Akin Fenwa, scores again. And I've scored against his beloved Hartlepool many times. I can't wait. To, I can't wait for this. I can't wait for great. this. I'm looking forward to it as well. And although it's an international week this week, we still have an EFL round of Super 6 for you. Um, make sure you tweet us. Hash, mm, Make sure you tweet us, hashtag Super 6 Podcast, and follow us at Super 6. Let's get into it. Okay, so obviously, B, we mentioned at the top there. Can I call you B? Yeah, yeah, come on now. I'll call you OW, man. There we go. It's much easier, isn't it? Mm. Much shorter. Um, you are obviously distraught because that's your Liverpool side. Yep. Have you ever been on the end of a thrashing, though, that you've been involved in? Oh, yeah, man, a few. Oh, a few. The first one, the first thrashing I got of significance was... We played in the UEFA Cup. It was FK Atlantis against Rapid Bucharest. And the second leg, we lost 8-1 <laughs> at their place. And I can remember because I was just standing on a halfway line with their defender. He didn't speak. He spoke broken English. And he was just like, oh, how you doing, big man? And I was like, I'm OK. And then one, we cleared the ball and we, he headed it out. And then we just went back to the halfway line. And I was just watching goals go in. It was a humbling experience where you're just like oh gosh so that was my first one I think we lost yeah I think it was 8-1 at their place so it was a smashing can I just ask really quickly before you go into the next one yeah. in a game like that do you want to be subbed off not not for me at that time just because it was UEFA Cup um, and it was like one of the first times I played at a massive stadium and there was like 60,000 people there so you know it was like oh, this is this is European and it was just like Oh, but it was when you're just after like five goals in, you're just like, right. And they just kept the ball. And they were moving it around. It was just... So but I'm standing there. I'm young at the time. I think I'm 21 um, or 22 maybe. So I'm young at the time. But I'm just standing there with the centre half. I can remember it. So standing there with the centre half and he's just like, oh, you're, you're kind of big. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll run to the corner because they clear it. And then it would get kicked back in and then we'll just, we'll travel back to the halfway line and get there and just start a conversation again. That was the first time where I remember like it was a real thrashing and then closer to home I think we played Northampton against Shrewsbury at home and I think we lost 6-2 mm. 
and again that was just it was just a beating um, um, it was a beating so yeah I've been part of a few thrashings it's nasty because you go into the changing room afterwards and you can't say nothing there's literally, literally I don't care if I think I scored in the we lost 6-2 and I maybe scored 2 maybe scored 1 but ultimately you can't even say I did my job <laughs> because you just got beat so you're sitting there <laughs> waiting for the manager to go in one manager went out another one was like there's so much I can say I'll be here all day so get showered and come in tomorrow and it's just it's not a nice feeling so oh, we've got some reactions of the of the pundits this weekend on Sky Sports, um, how they reacted to these significant losses. Because we're not only talking about Liverpool, we're talking about Manchester United getting absolutely thumped by Spurs. Um, Patrice Evra on Manchester United said, I would really like to end my contract with Sky because he just didn't want to talk about it anymore. He's like, I'm done. Um, you also said take Maguire out the squad as well. There was lots of conversation around that. Um, Jamie Carragher on Liverpool said, I was almost laughing at the end. This one, this one made me laugh when I was watching the game because he, he genuinely started laughing in comms. He was like, he was watching them defend and he was like, I don't know what's happening. This is comical. It just sometimes it gets like that. It just, the game was so, what's the word I'm trying to look? It was just so mad. I'm just going to go for mad that when you're commentating and especially when you're defending, especially when you don't associate Liverpool with that, you end up just being like, oh, I've just got to laugh this off because what's going on like and that's just you know Carragher don't bite his tongue anyway so he doesn't another person who doesn't bite their tongue is um, Gary Neville he said on Manchester United absolutely disgraceful um, it was it was amusing like I said for the neutral to have Carragher and Neville in comms on those significant games back to back I mean it was just it was a crazy day wasn't it this is what Graham Souness said on Villa They've left the grass longer to stop Liverpool from playing. And he did say at the time, Barry, he was like, I know what you're going to say, I know what you all think, but I'm just saying. And, and and Dave James pulled him up on it and said, it sounds like sour grapes. What did you think? That's clutching at straws. You can't even... <laughs> and you know what? What For me, I've learned... <clears throat> excuse me. I learned a long time ago is but karma is real and comes round quick. Because after this, the Man United game, I got in my WhatsApp the picture of Evra's face and Sunes's face laughing. I had that picture straight yeah. away and we're laughing because we've got Man United supporters in my group. Same. Carragher would have laughed at Neville prior and then within 90 minutes, it is reversed and a worse score because we didn't get a man sent <laughs> off. Karma comes around quick. So I don't say nothing until after the after we've done what we need to do. But listen, it's it's clutching. Don't get the game twisted. Long or, or long or short, like we know and Liverpool players not listen, it weren't good enough. So regardless of what, but yeah, man, he was just clutching. We did our team of the month last week and um, a lot of people on social media were commenting that a lot of your team yeah, were Liverpool were, players. They were jumping on me um, again. Are they gonna be in your team for the next team of the month? But there was only one game. Like, why are you jumping on? Like, Liverpool lost one game. Like, but at the end of the day, and let me tell you, whoever jumped to me, there was a person that jumped on me and said, oh, typical Liverpool supporter, I ain't got one Everton. To and I was like, if you listen to the show, we had the choice between Calvin Lewin or Vardy. LW picked Calvin Lewin before me or he would have been in my team. So all those people that was jumping on me, because see, I'll be fine there. People like to jump on me. You know what I'm saying? So listen, don't jump on me about my Liverpool players. You interviewed Maguire mm. prior to the game. I did. So yeah. right now, I think you're kind of like the new Drake curse. I, I, I'm throwing <laughs> that out there. You be interviewing people and it just began horribly wrong. How was that interview and what do you say about you being the new Drake curse? So, um, on the Drake curse, first of all, to be honest, I can't I can't disagree with you because when I think about the the real high profile interviews that I've done for Sky, um, I interviewed Jose Mourinho just before he got fired at Manchester United. Oh. Um, I interviewed Maurizio Pochettino just before he got fired at Spurs. Oh, so this is real, real? This is real. And I interviewed Marcus Silva just before he got fired at Everton. Um, so, yeah, game or two games but before they got fired, all of them. Um, but I don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm a Let me tell you when it's certified. When they start making tracks and they start saying, I ain't taking a picture with LW because she the fiery, she the fiery one. <laughs> Aye, when they start, it's certified. Right now, they haven't picked up on it. But now, you just show me what... Hey, if Maguire gets put out the team, <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. 
LW is the new Drake curse. I'm just saying. There was another, there was a run as well that where I had a few weeks back to back to back where I'd interview a player, I'd take a photo, put it on social media, they'd lose. Ah, uh, yeah. It happened and, and it was a real thing for yeah, a while. Yeah. But it, obviously, lucky I, listen, lucky I'm still injured because I ain't taking no picture with you prior to my first game with the championship. I get my ass sent off or something. I ain't playing with you. Can I just say though, on the subject of Harry Maguire, um, so that interview with him was, it's difficult at the moment for Manchester United. It's just got even more difficult and I heard what Jurgen Klopp said after the game actually about the Liverpool side he was like I wish I could get them all back in training tomorrow but we can't because it's an international break yeah. it's almost the worst time for it isn't yes. it um, so for Harry Maguire obviously like they all go back onto international duty and they can't get together as a team um, which is frustrating for them as well for Manchester United whose pre-season was it's obviously disrupted they didn't get back together they didn't have a lot of time to, to solidify and do whatever you do in, in pre-season um, and it shows And um, but the interview with him he really he fronted up to it he acknowledged the fact that it's not good enough defensively it's not good enough um, He, I was asking him about whether or not they need new signings he was like we've got a big squad etc etc but what I really um, liked talking to Harry Maguire about and I wanted to, to shine a light on it just in case no one's seen it or, or will hear it is so I was asking him about um, social media abuse um, because we at Sky, we did this big campaign about it and uh, about the abuse that presenters get. And um, I asked him about his abuse and, and his experiences. And um, he was like, obviously, he spoke so clearly and, and, and really honestly about it. He was like, obviously, it really affects you. He said, but now I, I, I can't read it. I don't read it. That's the way that he deals with it, um, which is really sad as well because it kind of means that footballers can't you know, they can't interact with people even when they want to. Some do, some don't. You take it differently, don't you? Um, but I also asked him, I was like, as captain of Manchester United, do you feel like you have a responsibility to help the younger players, like, you know, the Mason Greenwoods of the world? And he was like, you know, some of these players with social media, they just like that are superstars overnight. Yeah. And their following goes from like something tiny to something major. And with it comes the scrutiny and, and with it comes Manchester United scrutiny as well. So it's like these are there are so many different levels to, to this kind of um, attention and abuse and the way that social media is used with football players. Um, and the fact that you can just be a you can be a punch bag for people just because you're a footballer it's like you know just you you have this status therefore everyone feels a right to to abuse you for either your performance or the way that you look the color of your skin as well yeah, as we've yeah. discussed before as well um but he spoke really really well on it so that's just something that i wanted to say obviously you can criticize his performance as a pundit does and that is the that is the realm that is acceptable but abusing them personally and abusing their family members and, and things like that and one thing he did say he said that he doesn't read it but his family do and he said, those are the people that get hurt around me. And, yeah. and that's what affects him the most. And that really resonated with me. I thought, God, that's awful. Yeah, you see, you've touched on it there. It's I've, I've said this many times. I feel that pe just because people put football in front of it, all of a sudden they feel like they're not humans. Mm. And what people need to understand is we are not, and well, I'm saying not, ev not everybody is set up to take that level of attention. Yeah. So you got, like you said, you go for when you've got a million people. So then you just take half of those people saying negative stuff. And the one, the, the, the people that start saying it, just think about if an, another thousand people continue to say what you're saying and go personal, mm -hmm. how it makes somebody feel. And that's the thing where people I don't think understand. You're right. It's, uh, look, I've, over the years for me, I think there's superficial abuse or hurt. And then there's, internal hurt mm. I think the internal hurt comes for those that's closer to you that, that can hit your soul I think the superficial pain is the ones that don't know you and they're just jumping on and want to be keyboard warriors certain people can handle it certain people can't you know what I'm saying I'm the same with Harry Maguire it's not that I don't I see it if I won't take advice from you your abuse is not going to affect me so mm. I see it and I just swipe on or I keep it moving but you're right these young footballers who have either just come out of school, ain't really dealt with many experiences in life, good and bad, get onto a stage where people want to take personal... Listen, it's a, it's, football's an industry where you have to go out quick. We get that. And if you want to say, listen, you, was, oh, you, you, you you're you poor, you shouldn't be in the team, that, that comes with it. It is what it is. It's somebody's opinion. Only only opinion that really matters is the manager because he's the one that's going to pick you. So all those other people that want to say what they want to say... You don't pick the team, so it is where it is. But when you go personal, and that's what I just say, and this is not me preaching, it's just pause sometimes when you're sending these hurtful, 
messages and see that if your mum read something about you that you're writing to somebody how it would make your mum feel or your little sister or and that's what it is in the sense where look words are powerful so be careful what you put out there so what my guy said was right you know what i'm saying listen nobody sets out to be bad nobody sets out to play bad talk about his football say listen i don't think you're cutting it right now or come at your team or x when you start going personal it, it it's problematic and you know what it's it's a problem that we need to address and, and try and solve. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're going to do a quick quick fire round now. I suppose that's the only way you can do quick fire, isn't it? Quick. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say that. Yeah, I'm saying quick fire round, we're going to do it quick. Yeah. But who do you think had the best transfer window? Um, you know what? For all the abuse I've been getting, I'm actually going to say I think Everton. I think Everton have signed well. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, they've started well. I think Villa's done well as well. And I'm not even going to go on just because they whooped Liverpool's arse and that. I just think when you saw the players that they were bringing in, you're like, OK, you know what? Mm-hmm. They're going for it. And if it clicks, they're going to be a problem. So I would say either Everton or Villa. I would actually agree with you on both those. When you said Everton, I thought Villa immediately because when you look at the table, perfect teams. But the upturn in form for me is is so significant. Um, I will mention Arsenal just because I love a transfer deadline day signing. Um, Thomas Partey's come in. I think that position is so key for Arsenal. Yeah, you lot are mad excited about this yeah, guy. Like, yeah, my, we are. my WhatsApp group was going off. You're yeah, excited about yeah, him. Like, okay. Because he could be the cog that does it all. You know okay. what I mean? He could be the strings. He could be that kind of guy. Um, I'm hoping so because they spent a lot of money on him um, so fingers crossed I know we wanted OR but uh, it hasn't happened potentially maybe in the future I don't know but there might be bigger teams that are coming in for him oh, did I say bigger teams yes. or the Arsenal faithful yes Sorry. yes say that again that bigger yes. teams <laughs> you know what I mean the Real Madrid's because I know that they're not going to spend big in this window but they will be planning for the future so hopefully we haven't missed our chance with him that could be something in the future but look um, Thomas Partey um, yeah I love what they tweeted as well no Thomas no Partey yeah it's nice yeah um, okay fine who had the worst win <laughs> oh, who had the worst window? Um, who didn't sign anybody? Um, maybe Fulham, um, West Ham. Mm. Um, oh, Fulham have just signed um, Loftus uh, Cheek. Loftus Cheek. Yeah, 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 that's only one. Like, which even though I think Loftus Cheek's a real good player, um, and I think he needs games, mm. and I think whatever experience he gets there will be good for him. I just think that I think they need more. And that's just by the way they started. I think they need more. Um, so It's like they swung the other way. Last time they got promoted, they spent over like 100 yeah. million and didn't really work. This time they're like, we'll be more... We'll be more cautious yeah, and, and see... Not yeah, like an so not, but to be fair, they've only signed him on loan as well. It's not like they signed him yeah. um, on a permanent. So he's only there for this season. So I think that, again, you can see that they spent 100 million first time and they're thinking, well, we went down. So let's mm. stay what we've got and try and con- consolidate for this time so I'll just say Fulham just because I think the lack of signings yeah what about Manchester United listen do you know the worst thing is I think that I think when Ibra come in Mm. I thought it was a good signing I thought he made everybody around him and his character his confidence and I think that's what United's lacking Um, it went the other way when they signed Falcao listen I get that but Cavani's done it you know Um, and uh, listen I'm an advocate for older players because I'm still playing at my age sort of thing so he's 33 the only thing is and I agree with what everybody said is this is the longest window that's been open so why does it seem that you went and signed three players on deadline day it just then all of a sudden seems like they were reading social media Mm. the lack of um, movement the lack of transfers they just said listen we'll get whoever's out there at like on the last minute dot com but listen I I think football's a gamble sometimes anyway and if it does pan off then um, maybe it will be a good thing and sometimes you just need nude faces you know maybe at United now it's a bit stale when everybody's just used to it and it's become a bit mundane you bring in three new faces three new energy maybe it can be so listen I'm, I love, you know me I, I'm a Liverpool man but I don't wish bad on anybody so if it clicks it clicks um, I hope it don't but you know what I'm yeah. saying um, okay. but I think it if it clicks it'll be a good thing and if not then it is what it is one of the biggest news stories 
to hit social media and all the papers this week wasn't about signings necessarily. It was about somebody that was made redundant. So Gunasaurus released by Arsenal. <sighs> And then Ozil comes out of nowhere and he's like, you know what, I'll pay his wages for as long as I'm at the club. Um, I'll share the load. You know, I get so much money, I've got to share it around a little bit. I actually thought it was a really nice touch from him. I don't agree with a lot of the criticism because I think the club decided to pay him that money. So yeah, it was the club's decision. Whether or not he's... Stop that. You know the word? Sorry, mm. let me jump on that because I don't understand why you're jumping on Ozil. Like in any walk of life, and this is why I keep saying, well, because you put football in front of it, it's all of a sudden saying, "Ah, oh, this." If it was, if mm. they wanted to pay a banker that money, that's what. They, if the club wanted to pay him that, they pay him that. But is the argument, and I agree with you, by the way, but I'm just countering it a little bit. Is the argument that he hasn't been performing to the point where he doesn't get picked anymore? So but, they're like, "You're not earning it." No, listen. Nobody sets out to play bad. Everybody dips in form. Mm. And that's just what it is. Like, he's human. So you can't... It, the, the contract's not set up that you play good, you get 350000 You play bad, you get £10. It doesn't work like that. So for me, it's... I get... And I, and the worst thing is, I understand that you're like, well, listen, you're not earning your money, you're not mm. running about, you're not scoring goals. But that happens in football. And that's why there's contracts. So when he does do good... If Arsenal want to get a hundred million from him, they get a hundred million from him. It it works. It safeguards both. Um, and when you dip, you dip. Um, so I don't. I agree in the sense where I understand that Arsenal are like, listen, you're paying him this, and he's not running. His, listen, I understand that, but you can't. For me, you can't begrudge him. Yeah. for getting the best contract or his agent getting his best contract for him. Do you know what I'm saying? It's football. It's the world that we live in. If you want to have a go at someone, have a go at Arsene Wenger because I'm pretty sure it was under Arsene Wenger's reign that they decided to put him on this contract. Um, the other thing that really annoyed me about this is, do you know what? I'm just going to have a quick rant because I tweeted and I said, I love this. I, I, I saw what Meza Ozil had tweeted. Um, he does a lot for charity and I feel like everyone sits there and, and points the finger. You don't know the extent of the work that he does. We hear bits, you know, we hear drips of of the, the, the work and the charity, and the, the money that he offers. You don't hear all of it. A lot of footballers don't like talking about this kind of thing because they get criticised either way. What I hated when I tweeted that was people going, no, oh, we're sure he can do this. And, and yeah, it's just about right that he did this. He's on this amount of money. Were you helping out? Yeah, yeah. Were you doing that? Were you donating a percentage of your wage? I don't care if he's on £350,000 a week or if he's on £2 million or if he's on two. Everybody can do a little bit to help as well. And he's doing it. And actually, he's done it. Therefore, I'd like to praise what he's done rather than what he hasn't done. Do you know what I mean? I'm I'm with you. I I just think this is what I'm saying. I I feel when you put football in front of it and look, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm just look at it. If you just pause and look at your situation, listen, it don't matter if it's one pound you can give, a hundred pound or a hundred thousand pounds. You can do something, but you want to be like, oh, look, he's on 300,000. That's his deal. I, I keep saying it. There's bankers, owners of Amazon, oh, like billionaires out here that ain't doing the half of the stuff that he's doing, but yet still they want to drag him through. And I, I just, I, listen, I think that, I, I guess we're on a little bit of a rant here, um, <laughs> the both of us. I just, I, for me, it just, it don't sit right with me where he's doing a good deed, so don't look past it. Don't be like, oh yeah, well, he's doing a good deed. He's yeah. took it upon himself because not everybody is doing good deeds. You know what I'm saying? So he's doing a good deed. Personally, I think it's wrong of Arsenal to yeah. let go of this mascot who's been part of tradition and he's, mm. he's part of the fabric. I, I just think it's wrong when you can go out at the same time, go spend 45 million. I, listen, I don't know how much the, the mascot's on. I, I, I don't know how much money he's on. You know? But in, in the sense of, no, you know what? This is what we're trying to keep. You're part of the tradition. You're part of the club. We take care of our own. I just think it's... It, I don't say bad PR. I just think it's, it's it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. That's just me personally. But who am I again to tell Arsenal how to spend their money? That's what they want to do. I just... For me, I think if you can go and spend 45 million the joy he brings and he's been there I just think it's just a bit untasteful to let him go it happens further up the tree essentially is what we're trying to say these these business decisions are nothing to do with Meza Urza necessarily yeah. he's spending his money out of his own pocket doesn't matter how he's got it yeah. it's it's all done in the way that's been agreed by Arsenal so anyway we'll move on because actually the question I wanted to ask you is a lot lighter <laughs> what's the weirdest mascot you've ever seen <laughs> oh weirdest mascot oh that's from me oh I've got a good one for you um you have to come back to me. What's the weirdest mascot? Can I suggest one? Go because on. honestly, I've been waiting forever for this question to come up somewhere in media when I've been working. Kingsley, right? Partick Thistle. Yep. Replace that old mascot 
with what essentially is a star. So I think it's like related to sponsorship or something. It is, bio, I need to show it to you. It is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. What? <laughs> it's a star, right? Or something. But it is terrifying. But that must scare kids because oh. I ain't gonna lie. I'd be on my toes if that came up to me and said, let's take a picture. I think he'd be trying to rob me. I ain't gonna lie. Please, if you're listening and you don't know. Go check it out. Go and have a look. Partick Thistles. Um, he's, out, he's been there for like five years or longer, actually. I think a little bit longer than that. But oh my goodness, it's hilarious uh, and terrifying in equal measures. Um, okay, there you go. That was deadline day transfer. Done. All kind of wrapped up in one thing. We went a little bit off topic, but we did it anyway. England v Wales. Does Gareth Southgate have a job on his hands with squad discipline is this going to be another rant oh. <laughs> ah. just to fill you in if you haven't heard about it um, Greenwood and Foden obviously the last time they met up were sent home um, for their goings on Jaden Sancho was partying this weekend um, Ben Chilwell and obviously Tammy, Tammy Abraham, Abraham it's his birthday party they've been filmed they've been dropped um, so where do we stand on this do you know what and the worst thing is uh, look, you may want to come and give me slack on this Um and I, the, the worst thing is, I've seen them apologise. I've seen Tammy Abraham say, listen, it was a surprise birthday, um, but he's got to take more responsibility. And Sancho said that he didn't know how many people. What I don't get, like the, the worst thing is, I get the Greenwood and Folden. That was just, I think, young. And they get sent home. Fine. They live and they learn. They're kids. I get that. This one, what I don't get with what's, what's going on here, and I think I've said this, make it make sense. But, and I don't think it makes sense. So... We can go on trains with 100 people. We can go... So if they went to a restaurant and there were 60 people in the restaurant and they didn't know them and it was socially distanced, they wouldn't have got in trouble. But because there were 60 people... And the worst thing is I haven't seen the video, I ain't seen anything. But make it make sense. How is it okay to go into a restaurant with 60 people and eat food? And generally now, everybody gets two-hour windows for your table until you have to move on. So if I can sit there for two hours with 60 people and then it goes out and another 60 people, make it make sense where if they have a, a get-together, whatever it was, with 60 people. So if they done it, with they went to a restaurant, 60 people, and it was socially distanced, would that be okay? And that's what I'm saying. Make it make sense to me. But I, I just think that it's an excuse. No. Otherwise, things I don't want to. Is it an excuse to jump on footballers that are oh, that they had a party? Well, I'm just make it make sense. It's that's the crazy thing for me. I'm like, and of course, the, the FA have to be on, and England have to be seeing that. Like, Listen, no, it's discipline. I, I just for me, it don't make sense for me. It really doesn't. To counter it, you know, should we be saying that these guys they know know the rules and they should know the rules? England would have been really specific. What they'll do is put people in danger if they go to camp, having been in those kind of situations. So, you know, in hindsight, obviously they they have broken the same rules, even though one was on duty. So we talk about Mason Greenwood and Phil Foden. Theirs was within camp on duty. This one was outside of camp, about to go on duty. But should they have just known the rules and just be keeping their heads down? Look, so this is what I'm trying to ask you. So, if for his birthday he went out to a restaurant, oh, I know, I know, I and, know. and that's what. So, yeah. I'm, this is what I'm saying. But of course, they'll turn around and sit down. And I, I heard an interview with Calvin Lewin saying, "Look, Gav, um, Gav, safe get on the." They've said, "Listen, this is what we need to do." This is your responsibility and that. And, and listen, and the worst thing is I get it because we have it at football as well. Look, mm. there's a responsibility. There's, there's I, I, rules. It's, it's for all of us as it, well. Listen, I get it. But maybe I'm questioning the rules and maybe it's yeah. wrong. I'm, I'm questioning the rules to make it make sense for me because this is what's going to happen. Ultimately, we are humans mm -hmm. at the same time. And it's like, make it make sense. How is it even that? Like, we train with 20 plus people. We, we, we're around like every day we're around people the traveling uh, um, the working the, the, the going to the Royal Albert Hall they're saying Boris said go to cinemas we are around so tell me how to make it make sense and so I'm questioning the rules so I guess there's two elements do they know the rules and should they have not but yes that's just the simple layman terms of it look the guidelines from the club England this is what I need you lot to do right now because in these uncertain times so there's that it's an um, incident that they've got to deal with and Southgate said, you know the rules, you broke them, um, so this is what's going to happen. So then, then there's that. 
But then there's the bigger rules where I'm like, make it make sense because that is going to continue to happen. And then they're going to get held to a standard where they're breaking it and then we're having these sort of conversations. So maybe I'm questioning the rules. All I keep saying is make it make sense. Mm, okay, so basically, in summary, um, you don't agree with the rules sort of that the government are putting out because it's confusing, you want it to make sense. But we are in agreement and on the same page that those rules that are set out by England have been broken. Yeah. Therefore, the guys have to pay the consequences, unfortunately. Yeah, that, yeah. That's it. And and you know what? I, I do have a degree of sympathy because I think all of us at the moment are pretty confused. Um, I think it just gives Gareth Southgate another headache yeah. that he doesn't deserve. It, it doesn't, ne- doesn't, it doesn't need. need. It doesn't other, need. You know, that's the thing. He's got a game to prepare for now. He's going to have to change everything. Luckily, he's got a bigger squad this time around. So fingers crossed, England. Come on. All righty, <laughs> righty, righty. Alan, okay. Jeff, can you hear us? Hey, Bale, of course I can, mate. Uh, there's yeah, my legend, you know. Listen, there's not many oh, people mate. I get gassed about, but you my guy, you know, been my guy for years. Jeez. Oh, good lad, good lad. <laughs> Jeff's like, who am I speaking to? Yeah, no, he knows, man. <laughs> what he's written, no, no. no. Listen, because I play on a Saturday, I catch when he rips me every now and again, like, oh, <laughs> Akin Fenwa bumbled it in against Hartlepool. Don't think I don't know, you know. Don't think yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Hey, babe, I'd only do it from a distance, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very exciting moment for me because um, I don't think I've ever had the pleasure of into- introducing somebody quite at this status. Um, but I am delighted to say um, that we are joined by a very special guest. It's our first guest, actually, isn't it, Brian? Yes, on yes. On this podcast that we've been doing together. Um, and we must start as we mean to go on. We've set the bar very high. It's none other than Mr. Super Six himself. It's Mr. Jeff Stelling. Good morning, Jeff. Hi, Laura. Hi, Bale. Hey, what's going on? Listen, I've already said this, innit? Like, I'm a, I get excited every now and again. Um, I think people know that, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> Jeff is the guy. Like, you know when you've got, like, like the pinnacle, mm. like, the name Jeff? Jeff, you've made that name so cool, you know. Anyway, don't let me blow too much smoke up there, but you the guy, man. Jeff, can I can I just say something that will make you laugh? I hope it makes you laugh rather than anything else. So you know what you just said there about like Jeff, the name Jeff is synonymous with one Jeff. When the boys when the boys said to me, Jeff's coming on, I went, Jeff Shreves. Jeff Shreves? <laughs> nah, I see. Nah, I would have known. If they said Jeff when they say Jeff, I'm like it's the legend himself. <laughs> Say, listen, that's a big thing to do. He's made Jeff cool. Not saying Jeff ain't cool, but you made Jeff cool cool. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's a lot of backhanded it's, it's compliments. So, sometimes when I'm walking down the street, you know, people come up to me and say, hey, Shreezy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can only dream, eh? Uh, I give Jeff. him a good chase and I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to have you on. First of all, Thanks, how Laura. are you? And, and how was your weekend? I mean, busy, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, well, busy, but obviously for us, you know, the fact that all the Premier League games are spread out through the weekend, that you know, it doesn't help soccer Saturday. Mm. But I mean, the great thing is, you know, we've got Championship League, one league, two, National League kicked in this weekend as well. So it, it was a busy week. It's a good weekend for me because obviously, you know, I love the lower leagues and, and yeah. I love the Premier League as well, don't get me wrong. But I love the lower leagues too, so that was fantastic. Yeah, that's See, where your heart is. Isn't yeah, it? that's what I, I ain't gonna lie. That's where I, the reason why I think I I take you so much. Because listen, I played most of my career in the lower league, so I've got, of course, I've got this connection with the lower leagues. And because you are the pinnacle, and you've got that connection, you always bring light back to the lower leagues. Look, the Premier League don't need any more um, publicity and that. But the way you sit on the crown and yet still show light and show that you know you've just got that connection to your Hartley Port. Me, I love it. I ain't gonna lie to you. I do love it, Jeff. You that guy again. I'm gonna stop blowing smoke hey. up your ass. You're that guy again. <laughs> but Bale, you know what it's like because you played down there. You know that it's an absolutely fantastic product, you know? And the great thing about the lower leagues for me, and I won't bang on about it all the time now, is you feel a real relationship between fans and players. You know, you're not... When you're playing, you know, Wickham fans, I mean, they can approach you, they can come up to you, they can yeah. talk to you in a way that, you know, Premier League fans can't, not with their heroes, they can't really get to meet them, you know? It's much more real down at, at sort of Football League, National League level. 
Jeff, I want to just pull you up before we do anything on on all the moments that you've been having on Soccer Saturday in the new season. Um, I just want to ask you, while we're on the topic of the lower leagues, um, at the moment, football is is obviously in this place related to COVID uh, where we can't get fans back in the stadiums. And it feels like this week and last week as well, there's there's been a real push by um, the governing bodies, um, anybody really that has a voice in football that's saying, look, we've, we've got to find a way to get this sorted. If you can get half capacity in the Royal Albert Hall, then you should be able to do something with football outside where it's different, you know. Um, but there's so many livelihoods that, that rely on opening football back up to fans. I just wondered what, what your thoughts were on all of this and, and how you think, I'm not going to ask you to do the government's job and, and figure it all out for us, but how you think it's going to affect football clubs if it continues like this? Well, I had a little bit of a, a, a dig at this on Saturday, Laura, you know, um, uh, one of the reasons was because on Friday I'd been in London and I'd been on an underground train mm. at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon and I was shoulder to shoulder, you know, with hundreds of people and, and hundreds of people who changed every stop as well, you know, and they've got their hands on that bar, and their hands up on there, you know, on a train that's been used all day long. And I think, well, you know, if that is OK, then how mm. can it not be OK? And that's an enclosed yeah. environment, obviously. How can it not be OK? to have crowds back in these lovely open-air stadia, you, you know, um, either in little bubbles or groups of six, but, but whatever, they're in the open air, you know, where there's much less risk of them contacting anything. Now, if they can do it at the O2 and they can do it at Royal Albert Hall, indoor venues, of course they can do it within football. You just, you know, I, I think a lot of the big clubs and, and probably a lot of the clubs in the, the football league, they're ready, they're waiting, they've got everything in place to have crowds back and you know I, from a lower league level we all we all know the argument that there isn't any money coming in at all you know you rely completely not on tv money you know you rely completely on gate money you know and maybe sponsorship money that comes through the fact that you have got a product you know that you can you can wear the shirt that's sponsored um and certainly at, at our level national league level it, it it's hurting like mad. And the government gave, a, you know, a grant of £10 million pounds last, last week. And we were grateful. Of course we were grateful because it meant that the league could actually get underway. But £10 million pounds to last three months between 67 clubs for what is the price for a Premier League side of a reserve right back? I mean, the imbalance is crazy. Mm. See, I, the, for me, I... That's the thing. When you're talking there, I just I think the the hardest thing for even myself and everybody is to make it make sense. And that's just the and that's the thing. It it don't make sense when you break it down like that. We're all scratching our heads in the sense where please make it make sense. So if you can half can fill capacity of indoor arenas, how can you not? feel half capacity of outside it's literally making it make sense and I'm as passionate as you um, because I know first hand say we as Wickham didn't make it up to the championship last season we would be struggling I'm not saying we ain't struggling now but we would be overly struggling now so it hits home to me because I know with one kick in of the ball in the um, playoffs finals we would be struggling now and you know paying the bills and it's for me it's just that that it's so many livelihoods and listen I know there's a pandemic going on and I know that the government say they're trying to do best for peoples but then they are creating so much more other problems because of what is happening and listen I, I, listen, I get it I, I, I do I get it and it it just it just don't make sense and it just doesn't sit right mm. okay right Jeff I want to get your thoughts as well and Obviously, the big games, really, with all the goals, a lot of stuff happened on Saturday, as we know, but Sunday was, was just a crazy day. No, let's not talk about Sunday, people, please. No. Please, <laughs> let, let's, let's just say Sunday never happened um, and we can just bypass it, you know what I mean? i got to be honest, honestly. So I was watching that game and um, I'd done the Arsenal game earlier on, so I was at the Emirates for Arsenal-Sheffield United. Um, not that much, I mean, obviously, a couple of VAR conversations to be had, but there wasn't that much drama and then... And you go home and you're like, hang on a minute. You watch one game and you think Manchester United, right? That's a bit weird. Then you and Liverpool pop up. And you're like, well, order will be restored. I just couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. My mum was sitting in the other room with my stepdad, and I kept going, another goal. Villa scored again. They were like, what? It was just, it was incredible. Um, Jeff, where did you watch it all, and what did you make of it? 
Yeah, I always spent the whole day, the whole day on Sunday, just sitting on a sofa watching football. <laughs> um, what did I make of it? Well, I mean, it was an amazing day. You know, the start the, the Liverpool game, you know. Be careful, Jeff. I think you have a good season. Be I mean, it's easy to say they have a good season now, but they made some great <laughs> signings with Ollie Watkins and Ross Barkley yeah. and the, you know Martinez, Keeper, the goalkeeper. Yeah. They made some fantastic signings, and you, you you go to somewhere like Villa Park, and and the one thing you do you, you don't want to do is concede in the first few minutes. So what do we do? We get a goalkeeper again, trying to play out from the back. <laughs> And they can't do it. A lot of them can't do it. I mean, <laughs> Bear, what, is, what does Gareth tell, tell the keepers at Wickham? I mean, do they play out from the what? back? What? Let me, let me let, and maybe I'm paraphrasing what Gaffer would say, but Gaffer says, kick the ball as far as, as <laughs> far as way from our goal as possible. Yeah. And, and, and listen, I'm old school. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, look, kick the ball up front. They can't score if the ball's up front. So, uh, listen, I'm the same with you. I'm very much, when they got both centre-offs in the um, in the penny oh. area, they want to play, I'm like, oh, well, that's not my ream. You know what I'm saying? But I'm with you. I'm, I'm Listen, I'm with you. It hurt my soul. Listen, I'm, now, I don't sugarcoat it. I'm a Liverpool supporter. And I was in my car and I was talking to my friend through my phones. I wasn't on it, but, and he was talking me through the game and he was like, it's 2-0. I was like, oh my days. Then it was 2-1. So I was like, all right, boom. Now we get 2-2 two, two mm. before half time. Klopp's going to get us in at half time and we are going to, then he said, it's another goal and another goal. And I was like, what? It was, I'm, it was just, it wasn't a nice place to be. I tell you that now. How, how do you, when you look at that game, how do you make sense of that? Because, the comparison, like you say, Jeff, the new signings for, for Villa are incredible. But Ollie Watkins was playing the championship last season. So there's some people that are saying, I wonder if he could do it in the Premier League. He's doing it in the Premier League and he's doing it against the champions. Emi Martinez is a brilliant goalkeeper. Like all Arsenal fans like I am saw that when eventually he got his opportunities. And uh, and in terms of Ross Barkley, that connection that he has with, with Jack Grealish... I've been laughing my head off because if you go online and you see people praising the Jack Grealish and the Ross Barkley connection, there's pictures of John McGinn in the background looking all full on, like, don't forget about me. We used to be best <laughs> friends, me and Jack. It's just been making me laugh. But, Jeff, how do you make sense of, of what happened to Liverpool? It can't just be all the goal, a goalkeeper, can it? No, no, no. And it wasn't just the goalkeeper either, but that just set the pattern for the day and mm. it let Villa get their tails up, you know. And um, look, I mean, Dean Smith knew what he was getting, obviously, with Ollie Watkins because he'd worked with him before. So yeah. he knew that he had the quality. And um, as far as Liverpool are concerned, look, I mean, they, they miss people. It sounds daft, you know, to say you miss somebody um, when a forward when you've conceded seven goals. But they miss Sanyo Mane because yeah. he starts off the press yes. from the front, you yes. know. And that's where they start to defend from, right at the front. So they... They missed him, that is for sure. As it happens, I think when the game was 2-1, I thought they should have had a penalty as well. Yes, you know, yes. um, I, I thought Mo Salah was clearly brought, brought down mm. in, inside the box. I, and I couldn't understand why that wasn't given. And that could have changed the game. But with Liverpool, I, I honestly think it's a one-off. If you had asked me who's going to win the title, at this stage, they've lost 7-2 against the side who only just stayed up at the weekend. But I think... I'm convinced Liverpool will still win the title this year because I just see that as being a one-off. They miss Jordan Henderson as well. Yes, I mean, yes. You know, I mean, every team misses players, so it's easy to make that a, a, an excuse. But there's some key players, you know, Mane, Henderson, Alisson, right down the, the spine of the team, as they say. Um, I, I think that's a one-off. I'd be more worried if I was a Manchester United fan because I'm not convinced that is a one-off. But wow. that's another subject. That was what I was just going to ask you about that quickly before we move on, because I feel like we can't mention Liverpool without mentioning Manchester United, because that was really... I interviewed Harry Maguire just before, Jeff, and I don't mean just before the game, I mean a couple of days before, and, and he was very... You know, what you'd expect him to say, listen, it's not good enough. We're not defending well enough. He wouldn't be drawn into a conversation about signings, what areas they need to strengthen. He was like, we actually have quite a big squad. You know, we've got more than enough for a couple of, of 11s and, and we can rotate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He, he did say their preseason. He mentioned that, of course. And I asked the question about the fact that they are probably still chasing their tails. But that performance, Jeff, I mean... I was watching all the post-match analysis and, and, the, and the pundits absolutely spewing. The fans are going mad. I mean, what do you put that down to? I, I, you know, we know Manchester United's weaknesses. Everybody can see their weaknesses, you know. Everybody can see the weaknesses at the heart of the defence that they haven't got any pace in, 
in there or maybe not enough quality. You know, they've got weaknesses down both flanks as well. Um, Pogba doesn't look like he wants to be there half the time. You know, everybody can see Manchester's vulnerabilities. And, and make no mistake, they were lucky to get away with 6-1 <laughs> because there was a period of the first half where Spurs were absolutely battering them. It could have been 7-8-9, could have been double figures almost, you know. Completely unacceptable. And then you get the transfer window, comes round, and, and they bring in a, a 33-year-old centre forward who's a wonderful player. Mm. But but not what they need. You know, they've been chasing Jadon Sancho. Not what they need. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, I just don't understand what's been going on at the club. You know, yeah, they want to go out and show that um, they can bring in the biggest names. Mm. But, but I, I almost think Cavani's been brought in for show, you know, because mm. they couldn't get the players they really wanted. So they had to show that we are still Manchester United. We are still the biggest club in the world. We can still attract the biggest players, even if we don't need them. See, my, on that, um, on that, just, I, I feel that, I actually don't think Man United squad is that bad. I actually, I honestly look at it. I think Wan Bissaka is one of the best right backs defensively. Listen, I, I get about Luke Short, which I still think he's good. I think Eric Bailly is cool. I think Harry Maguire, I think they lack pace. But if you look at that squad, I actually they sh they're still up there. You know what I'm saying? On so there's something fundamentally wrong in that Man United because the players. Personally, when they, maybe because I'm looking from a lower league up, I, I look at that squad and I'm like, you should be on your worst day, still be up there in the quality they've got. So there's got to be something fundamentally wrong at United. Well, all you've got to do is look to last season after lockdown and that run they strung together. It's the same players, essentially, isn't it? Same players. Is it a confidence thing then? <laughs> it's got to be, Jeff. It's got to be. No, it's got to yeah. be a confidence thing. It's got to be a confidence thing. Yeah, I, 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 obviously a lot of it is down to confidence, but you know, I, I, I wonder about one or two of the characters in the dressing room. You know, I, I, I'm not sure what the mood is. Well, I know what the mood's going to be like in that dressing room at the moment. It's going to be rotten, uh. um, but I'm not sure what the mood, generally speaking, is 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 like in in the dressing room. Um, do they all give absolutely everything for Ollie? Mm. Uh, well, you know, I, I hate to suggest they might not, but I think they might not. And I think it's it's grossly unfair on the manager, who generally speaking, I think you know, has done pretty well, certainly towards the end of last season. They did brilliantly well, Yeah, you, you know, and, and he deserves his opportunity to carry on, to try and, and, and build them back to what they were. Um, we can't carry passengers. And I, I think they've got a couple who would go down in the in the passenger category. All right, last thing though, so just recently they were talking about Tottenham, saying Tottenham didn't score enough goals, they were always defensive, parked the bus, and what, they must have scored, what, 20 plus goals in three or four games? So is it confidence? Because it doesn't look like Mourinho's changed anyway, and he's in, Mourinho stated and backed and said, listen, my strikers always score goals. You lot think Harry Kane won't score goals. Son's come in, score like four goals a game. I know I'm, I'm making it big. So, but they've come in and they're just blowing teams away. So is that a a belief in, look, trust in the process and we'll get there in the end because that's what's Tottenham. All of a sudden, people are saying um, Harry Kane has to leave to further his, um, his career mm. to win something. And now Tottenham look like they're just putting six past or five past every team they play. So it, there is something there in the sense of a confidence or believing in the manager or trusting in the process because Tottenham showed in this period anyway that they've either trusted Mourinho and... I mean, I know a couple signings and confidence is maybe players are now looking at, oh, they bought in Gareth Bell, so everybody now has to up their game um, and know that, listen, the manager's going to be here for a long haul, so it's his way or no way, whereas there's always an uncertainty with Oli. I mean, maybe that's where it is um, with United. But anyway, we've spent like a, a long time on it. I want to roll mm -hmm. something on you, Jeff. Tell me, what goes on behind the scenes... <laughs> on Soccer Saturday? Because we only see, <laughs> like, the front. You know what I'm saying? What goes on behind the scenes? And I want a question. Is there anybody that you kind of feel is a diva <gasps> that's on, a on Soccer question. Saturday? Is there anybody that's a diva on Soccer Saturday? Any divas on Soccer Saturday? Well, you know... <sighs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're all on. divas in the sense... They all like a bit of pampering, don't they? You know? <laughs> and, but, for example, I mean, when, Clint, when Clinton comes in, you know... 
if you don't compliment Clinton on what he's wearing, <laughs> you know, on, his, on his dress sense, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get know, him on that. He'll, he'll have a little sulk. You know, not for long, because Clinton can't sulk, you know? Do you know what, Jeff? It's so funny you should say that, because you know they're doing the preview show now, so Sky Sports News do a, a Super Sunday preview show, and the brilliant Vicky Gomesall hosts it, and she has Clinton Morrison and she has Darren Lewis from The Mirror. And um, I love Darren. I think he's one of the most fabulous journalists and he's such a nice guy as well, isn't he? He's just brilliant, so softly spoken. Yeah. And he always looks so sharp. And I do a little cross into that show in the morning from wherever I am on Sunday mornings, whatever game I'm at, the two o'clock kickoff. And um, I've taken to complimenting Darren on what he's wearing, saying, Darren, by the way, you look exceptional today. It's just something I like to do. Anyway, I got a text off Clinton last week. Don't I? Don't oh, I look good? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know them ones. What about what I wear? It hurts our soul if you don't compliment <laughs> us. I already know. <laughs> it did make me laugh. He always looks great as well, though, doesn't he? But Darren looks sharp. Um, yeah. I want to ask a little bit about, about Soccer Saturday as well. How are all the new panellists settling in? It was obviously it's a big change for you, and, and you're at the helm, and you're, you're the one that has to kind of bring... I, I know from a, a presenter's side that, I mean, I'm obviously learning a lot from what you do. So how hard is it to bring new guests all together and, and create? A, a new environment and more chemistry. Hey, Laura, if you're trying to learn off me, you're in big trouble. Am I going down Don't the wrong path? Uh, <laughs> it would be difficult for the best of times, you know, but at this time, because we have to be socially distanced, mm. you know, for instance, I mean, last Saturday, we had people working from four different studios, me and two guys in one studio. Clinton was sitting upstairs in a, a, another studio. Ali McCoy was in Glasgow and Sue Smith was in Wilmslow. Oh. So that makes it really difficult to, to, to bring things together, you know. Um, and, and some people, you know, some people take the TV, you, you know, like a Dr. Water, you know. I mean, like you, Bayo, for instance. Oh. You, you know, <laughs> you, no, seriously, you, you, the great thing is, Somebody asked me about getting into the media and if I had, had it, you know, whether I would mentor him the other day. And I said, well, I, I won't mentor you. I said, because I wouldn't know what to say to you. Just be yourself. Yes. Be yes. yourself. And that's what that's what you do, which, which is why you, you settle in so well. But not everybody's like that. You know, some people are a, a little bit less outgoing, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, so I could go with that. <laughs> drag them out a bit. Um, and, and, and it, yeah, it could be it could be tricky, but the thing is, you've got to give people a chance. And and I know that our last panel, you know, we've been together for 10, 15 years and people loved them. And I did. And I said at the time, you know, they were my best mates uh, and, uh, and they are my best mates. But you've got to give the people who come in a chance. And I don't mean, you know, give them a show and say he wasn't great. Let's get rid of him. You know, they've got to be given a run because, you know, nobody's good at things. Usually nobody's good at things the first time they do something, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so give people a chance, you know. I, 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 I try and encourage them to chat and just to be themselves. And um, I, I think we'll see some, you know, really good new football pundits emerge over the next few months. Well, we've, we've seen it already, haven't we? Not this, not on my show, but, you know, Mike, Michael Richards is the obvious example. Yeah. You know, who suddenly burst onto the scene. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Literally, yeah. He's, literally. He's, he's literally. full of life, isn't yeah, it? He's beautiful. so full of life and, and everybody loves him. And, that, you know, I, I, I think we'll find more like that. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. That's that's the the best thing to say, isn't it? Is give people a chance. And right? you know yeah. what? And the second round, I think the best thing to say and the best advice that listen I run with is, is be yourself. Ain't nobody can be you or do you better than you. And that's I think that's a beautiful thing. And if the legend in the game is saying that, then you know it's real. So Jeff, salute. Jeez. Not only not only is he a legend in the game, but um, Jeff, we also have to call you the face of Hartlepool as well. How do you feel to have that mantle? Oh, I love it. I mean, I love it. it it's it's my hometown, you know, and um, on my wall just above where I'm sitting now, I've got the plaque that says I'm an honorary freeman of Hartlepool, so, you know, I can drive my sheep through the town centre if I want to. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm president of the football club and I'm part owner of the football club. And, um, you know, one of the best days of my life was uh, three years ago now when the club was was within 48 hours of going out of business. And um, I managed to negotiate with a guy called Raj Singh, who's the chairman now, for him to buy the club out. He'd only, he'd only do it if somebody else 
helped him by putting some money in, and that other person was me. Okay, so the club is is forty eight hours from going out of business. It sounds immodest, but we saved the club. Raj saved the club, and the first home game the following season, the the public address announcer the, uh, brought us both onto the pitch, and the fans were chanting. Um, Raj and Jeff's blue and white army, mm. and it was the best feeling, the Gee. best day that I've been able to do something, something for the town, you know. Because I mean, I've had a charmed life. I've been so lucky, you know. Um, I'm a council houseboy from Hartlepool who's had so many fortunate breaks all the way along the line. Um, so it's nice just to be able to give, uh, to give something back, mm. you know. See, I mean, that was three years ago. They give me a lot of stick now. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the beautiful thing. That's the the connection with the community. That I'm not saying big clubs don't they don't have it. They do. You know what I'm saying? But there is something so authentic about the connection between the lower league clubs and the community, and how much passion Jeff sp- speaks, and he speaks about every team, and you know, you just associate him with you know, the elite, because that's what he does. But the passion he talks about, Hartlepool, it's, it's beautiful. See, I keep that, you know what I'm saying? And that's why it's so important that we get fans back in the, in the ground, because that's what it is. The connection between the clubs and the community is just, it's a bond that's like no other. I mean, I love Hartlepool because the last time I was there, I scored. Um, I mean, I, I scored past <laughs> them quite a few times. Sorry, sorry, Jeff, but I do score past. <laughs> it's far, though. I ain't gonna lie, it's far. So it, i got to kind of make it worth my while to score past you team when I play against them so anyway <laughs> yeah I think you had a pretty good record against us I mean, the last time I was at um, I went to Wickham Hartlepool two or three years ago now and um, could, uh, we, we was I was with, was with all of my kids my three kids had all come with me to see the game and we're, we're all in the sort of um, you know executive room before the start and it's like 10 to 3 and who comes wandering in Except your gaffer, yeah. you know, Gareth comes in and he said, I heard you were here, Jeff. I had to come and say hello. And it's 10 to 3. Yeah, you know, yeah. Nothing that's, better to do. That's, his, that, that, that's, that's the guy, man. That's our gaffer right here. Unique character. I love in it, man. Leather jacket. Oh, I love him. I absolutely <laughs> yeah, love him. You know, we talk, you know, Bayo, when we talk about people being themselves, that's what you get with him as well, isn't yes. it? He's himself. Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful. And I, I'll always say that, and I've said this a, a few times, not just on this show, but I just think he's a unique character. He embraces his his individuality. Um, he, it's not like he don't conform, and that's where it is. He, he's like he said, his leather jacket. He loves to show his little brillo pad of chest hair. He's got his alligator shoes on. You know, it's just in, what I mean. Is he's is he's himself? That's the definition of being yourself. So I hey, listen. Everybody keep being themselves. You get me. I feel like um, I feel like I want to just like continue this conversation about oh, no. being ourselves. It's great, isn't it? It's like no. a little self help group we've got going on here. I'm very much enjoying it. But Jeff, I want to test your memory. Is that all right? Oh no! <laughs> Jeez. Okay. We've got some classic quotes, and um, basically, what we're going to do is I'll read them, then Bio will read them, and then we're going to try and get you to to tell us which moment on Soccer Saturday it was and who said them. Um, there's some from over the years. Some of them are, are, are longer than others. Um, I'm right. going to kick you off with the first one. Here we go. I'm not going to do accents because that would just be embarrassing. Yeah, yeah I definitely am not. I can't, I can't do it. Here we go. No, Jeff, someone's been sent off, but I don't know. I weren't concentrating, but I'll tell you in a minute. This game is flatter than one of my missus's Yorkshire puddings. Come back to me and I'll tell you who it is. <laughs> right. Um, you, you see, the first thought would have been Cammy, but it's not Cammy. That's what um, I thought. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's Dean Windass. Oh, you are um, straight in there. You're on the point. You're on it. Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey. Yeah, I, it, it, it's Dim it's Dim Windus, and I I said to him, he's got somebody send off, and I said I said give us a clue, Dean, which side? <laughs> I said, which team is that a player send off? You know, <laughs> and, and Dino would do that. I remember going to him live one day. He was at, he was at Middlesbrough, and there's been a goal as he's talk, as he's on the air, which and it's difficult for him. But he looks behind. He said, "There's been a goal. There's been a goal, Jeff." Um, uh, he said, "Come back to me. I'll tell you who scored." But I said, "I said, well, tell us which side of these things." <laughs> the best thing about it is that's not how it works, Steve. That's why you're there. Oh, you're there man. to watch it and then tell us. We can't come back to you. We just come to you. Oh, uh, amazing. Yeah. You got the next one. Uh, I've got the next one. Are uh, you ready, Jeff? This one yeah. is. They're fighting like beavers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we know this one. I mean, not lions, 
not tigers, <laughs> but beavers. It is the legend that is Chris Kamara. Yeah. Um, and he, um, it, you know, he covered a game a couple of weeks ago and Mark Beavers was playing for one of the sides, you know. It's just the first time that he's ever seen him play. Brilliant. Fighting Life Beavers, yeah, a, a, a cami legend. Right, this next one, um, I might have to paraphrase it if I don't get it exactly as it was said, um, but this is a classic. Well, maybe you should go also then, Jeff, because uh, you couldn't see driving home the other night because you have you don't even wear glasses in, in uh, TV in case you get you get slagged off. So why don't you just uh, you just stick to spec savers and I'll do the game? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the man who loves a midfield runner. <laughs> it is. It is Charlie Nicholas, of course, <laughs> Champagne Charlie. Um, you know, I mean... I, I don't know what the argument was over now. It was about whether somebody was offside or somebody wasn't offside. Uh, and, and Charlie inevitably was wrong, and I was inevitably <laughs> right. Um, and, and all he could do was abuse me, you know, should have gone to spec savers, that sort of thing. But, yeah, that was the joy of Charlie. That was the, 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 That is the joy, in, in a way, of the whole of the show is, you know, we talked about divas before. We haven't really got any divas because you can all take the mickey out of each yeah. other and everybody takes it in the right way. I think the energy is just... And that's what makes the show. It's the energy. It's the literally watching it. It's opinions going back and forth, not being too serious. The energy was just... It was just pure and you can't fake energy. But I've got another one for you then, Jeff. You ready? All right. Yeah. you got a bit of custard on your chin there, Jeff. <laughs> Just do, do it for me again, Bear. All right, here we go. You got a bit of custard there on your chin there, Jeff? Oh, I don't know. No? I don't remember I could, this. The worst thing is I should try and do it in his accent, but I can't pull it off. Go on, try I it. I don't know. No. Go Hell on. no. That would definitely go viral. I'm not having it. I'll just give you a little... I'll give you a little a little clue. He does like to, to, to wear an earring sometimes. Oh, not Charlie again. <laughs> yeah, Charlie again. it was Charlie is again. It? Yeah. Ah, you know. I mean, I probably didn't remember it because, you know, with him sitting at the far end away from me, I, mean, I, I, try, and, I try and switch off from him sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, he does like the sound of his own voice. So, um, so sometimes I, I, I switch. I don't remember that one, though. Yeah. Right, here's the last one, Jeff. They think everybody in the North lives in Coronation Street style terraces. They're the type yeah, that will buy is. skinny lattes and, you know, call their mushy peas guacamole. The sort who will go out to the Ganges on holiday so some bearded bloke can sit them cross legged. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. I don't even get that one, dear. This is great. Who's <laughs> that, was, Jeff? It, it goes on for a bit after that as well, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. um, th yeah, that was my Middlesbrough rant <laughs> um, many years ago now. And. Um, I, 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 can't, oh, I can't remember the name of the programme now, but it was a, a property programme anyway, basically. It had done a list of the worst places to live in England. And Middlesbrough was deemed to be the worst place uh, to live in in, in, um, in in the country. And I think Hartlepool was the 20th worst or something like that. And I said, I think it's upside down, you know, <laughs> because the people who put together those sort of lists, I think I said there, you know, they are the sort of people who think we all live in Coronation Street style terraces you know they've never been uh, north of Rickmansworth or, or whatever you know they haven't got a clue so Middlesbrough and Hartlepool you know they're just like anywhere else they've got some fantastic places they've got some not so fantastic places but what makes them is the character of the people you know now I'm not saying that other parts of the country don't have you know people with great characters well of course they do you know there's a lot a lot of the northwest is like the northeast, you know, for example, in, in terms of people. Um, and I think that's why Newcastle and Liverpool fans have always gone on so well together that they can relate to each other really well. But yeah, it was a rant about Middlesbrough. And um, yeah, it's sometimes, you know, if I do an after dinner, I, I don't know how many years old that is now, but it's probably 10, 15 years old, something like that. People still play that at the start of the dinner. <laughs> it still pops up on social media as well, actually. I yeah, didn't see it that long ago. I must have seen it about, I don't know, but a few months ago. It just does the rounds every now and then. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. Um, OK, Jeff, before you go, and it has been excellent, um, you have to do do us a favour. Um, so me and Bo have got an, an important question to ask you. All right, cool. All right, before you go, this is the question. You got to tell us your dream four-person panel lineup. This can be anyone outside of football, alive or dead. Who is your top four? 
Wow. Yeah. Ahem, ahem, ahem. Sorry, just yeah. clearing my throat <laughs> just in case. There, yeah, there was just a little cough that I just clearing my voice just and my throat. Anyway, yeah. just your top four. I've so only got three left, have I? Yeah, I'll just say, oh, listen, you're such a nice guy. I didn't even go there with you. But anyway, I like this guy. <laughs> Who's your top you. four? I love it if he didn't put you in it. You now. know, it's cool. <laughs> Who's your top four? I know between me and you, I'll be on the bench and I'll come on just in case they don't make it. Okay. But we'll, 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 we'll just say present company accepted. Ah, yeah, so. ah. He's a, he's, he's a boss. He knows what he's doing. Alive or dead? Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of basically going to stick with football, I think. Um, but Brian Clough would be one. Okay. You know, actually, That's a shout. Cluffy, That's a good one. Cluffy yeah. was on some of our earlier shows, you know. Um, was he? But it, it was so dangerous. It was so dangerous that to have him on. And that's beautiful, you don't know. Knew you never knew what, what he was going to say. Yeah. And you never knew quite what sort of language he was going <laughs> to say it in. It's not Murph. Uh, it's the same as Murph. Yeah, it's Murph as well. Was, he was brilliant, brilliant value. Um, Sir Alex, I would have Sir Alex on because oh, I just think, amazing. you know, he knows everything there is to know. And That's a powerful you know, lineup so far. Yeah. He, 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 he's a... And he's a man of the people. Everybody respects him. But just to make it really interesting, sitting next to Sir Alex, I'd have to have Arsene Wenger. Oh, you know, because yes. I think the two of them, they'd be very much like when Rodney Marsh used to sit next to Frank McClendock. <laughs> and Rodney would call Frank a dopey defender. You know, and, and, and Frank would have words with him. And it was great because there was a certain, there was a clash between them. Yeah. Um, they were friends, as I think um, Arsene and Sir Alex mm. are now but they had different philosophies. So yeah. I think that would work. Those two would work well together. Who's your last and, one? Um, I've got one left, have I? Hmm. Um, Why didn't you say that? That's a, such, a tough, such a tough question. I don't want to put any of the, the last lot of panellists in, you know, because then the others would all hammer me for leaving their mouth, wouldn't true. they? Mm, that's true. Yeah, so um, I tell you, you want to stir something up. This is, going, this is going to be a really controversial one now, but it, it's, I'm going to put a politician in who knows his football, is incredibly opinionated. I would put Alistair Campbell in there as well. Oh, oh right. You know, he went in through a curveball. Wow. Massive Burnley fan. Alistair Campbell, he went to, um, he went to a Hartlepool game with Lord Mandelson, who was then president of Hartlepool United, and Tony Blair, oh. okay? <laughs> And as the, as, teams, as the teams came out, so Alistair will tell you, as the teams came out, Tony Blair said to Lord Mandelson, said, which, one, which one's a Hartlepool? And the president of the club didn't know. <laughs> oh, so, so Alistair had to tell them what was what was what, you know. So, That's uh, Yeah, you know, something, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are some, we, re we really should have, you know, a, a woman in there as well, but. Maybe Laura. I'm available. <laughs> I'm available. Uh, you for didn't that even later. say me. Uh, you just said, like, hey, Jeff, you was my guy and you picked Laura. Hey, jeez. Hey, in a, in a few years' time, guys, or maybe shorter than a few years' time, <laughs> Laura will be presenting the programme and you'll be on the panel. <laughs> <there. laughs> I tell you what, and that I'll ever be asking happens. You for a job. The show's really gone to the dark. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I ain't gonna lie. Imagine gonna... me and you trying to no, remember anything. No, listen, it can't be. It can't be. I thought, that gonna happen. Jeff, when you said that you wanted to mix it up a little bit, I was like, he's going to put Gaza in there. Can you imagine? That would just be just pop gathering there, just for just for absolute. I mean, the joy of it would just be incredible. Um, and also, when you said a politician, I was like, hold on, he's not going to go David Cameron. And then you said, who knows about his football? Do you, yeah. Then I thought it's definitely yeah. not David Cameron. Yeah, yeah, Do you remember yeah. when David Cameron got his Villa and his West Ham mixed up? He thought he was a Villa fan, and he went, yeah, 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 I'm a I'm a I'm a West Ham fan. And everyone was like, hold on a minute, didn't you say you're a Villa fan? And he was like. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm a Villa fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would forget it. <laughs> he likes yeah. the colour of the shirt. Yeah, exactly. that man there. Exactly. He'd be a Northampton fan then. That man there. Jeez. <laughs> um, Jeff, it was just a pleasure. And, and we beautiful. knew it would be. Thank you so much for spending some time with us it this morning. It was epic. Jeff, thank you very much, my hey. brother. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Bayo. Thank you. Take we'll care. see you soon, Jeff. Take Peace. care. See you soon, guys. Now, we are on to round five for this season and even though the international break is here and the Premier League's taking a little bit of time off, there is a round of EFL action. So, you can go to the app, check the fixtures for this week and if you haven't got involved yet, download the Super 6 app, create an account and play for free by predicting the scores of six chosen matches to be in with a chance to win £250,000. Alright, alright, listen. For round four last week, there was five fixtures played on Saturday and one from Sunday. Amanda Well predicted all of the Saturday fixtures correctly. Oh. 
She then predicted Sunday's fixtures of Brentford versus Preston to be 3 0 to Brentford. All right, check this out, yeah? Brentford went 2 0 up at half time. But sadly for Amanda, Preston scored four goals in the second half. So she was 45 minutes away from winning the whole thing. Ah, oh, Amanda, I feel for you. But she still won the consolation prize of £6,000. You lot are brutal. I would have just given it to her. I uh, know, you I have to. I would have given to. it to her. We, one oh. goal, one goal. Jeez, jeez. Amanda, I'm so sorry. Six grand isn't too bad though, is it? Um, remember that we also have Super 6 League, so you can join by using the code SUPER6. And there is a £1,000 prize for the winner of that league by how did you get on last week uh yeah yeah i was terrible <laughs> i can't believe i'm really really bad at this game oh, look. look i scored two points <laughs> two two oh, yeah. i meaning i've got 19 for the season <laughs> like you scored 11 in that round alone because i take it serious so you're on 30 points oh yeah so i'm 19 you're on 13 i've got a long way out listen i've got a long way but to be fair jeff scored seven points so it wasn't that great like we're not really we're not really like like think... people are hitting scores and you guys this is fine because you're a player you don't have to be an expert but the fact that i beat you and jeff stelling that's massive do you know me. what that shows what? that this weekend was a crazy weekend. <laughs> the the goals, you beating both of us. It was an anomaly. Anomaly? Did I get it right? No, you didn't get it right. What's, how did I say that word? An anomaly. An I ain't trying to say that word, bruv. Say anomaly again, though. No, I'm not going to try and say <laughs> right, well, Say it again, say it again, say it again. Anomaly. Anomaly. Oh, there we go. It? You got oh, it. You got, got it. it. There you go. Uh, remember to invite your friends to join Super 6 because if any of your invited friends go on to win the jackpot, then you will win £25,000. Jeez. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening and thanks to Jeff, the main man himself, for chatting to us earlier. And don't forget to like and subscribe and the podcast will just automatically download to your device bio. We'll be back next week for new round Super 6 and plenty more chat. See ya. Peace and love. <laughs>